Well, basically, I'm a 32-year veteran in the oil and gas business. I, uh, I've only done oil and gas work my entire life. I started out in drilling and production, working out in the rigs for about eight years, and gradually worked my way up the ladder in drilling management, operations management, became a production manager, a vice president of operations, an executive vice president before I left the major oil companies, came up to London in 2003, created Victoria Oil and Gas in 2004, I was Victoria Oil and Gas's managing director until 2007, and in 2007 took on an asset in West Africa through an SPV, which ultimately got bended into a cash shell that we created that was put up on AIM called Bramlin Limited. Bramlin had kind of a difficult life. They were born in 2008, a very difficult period. When it came to placing equity for Bramlin, we just couldn't get it done. And ultimately, we ended up merging Bramlin into Victoria at the end of 2009. And in 2010, we started New World Oil and Gas. When we started New World Oil and Gas, we took a full year to develop a pipeline of projects. That means we looked at, reviewed, and scoped over 70 oil and gas opportunities globally. We had some places that we weren't specifically interested in because of our past, the former Soviet Union, Russia. But we, we really didn't limit ourselves. What we did is we looked at projects that had tremendous potential and tremendous upside, mainly in the areas of late stage exploration. Now, what do I mean by late stage exploration versus other opportunities? You can go out and buy proven developed producing reserves or oil fields which produce, but you're gonna pay full price. In fact, the sellers are gonna ask you to pay a price uh, on an escalated uh, price deck, an oil price on an escalated price deck, where when you do that, you're buying into your upside. Uh, buying late stage exploration has, if you will, a much lesser entry fee. And it provides us to offer the, the investors who support us, that invest in us, the 20, 30, 40 to 1. Should we be successful in applying our experience in the proper application of technology in, to make a discovery? Thirty-four days after we listed, we, we completed Belize. 124 days, we completed Denmark. Today's 215. At New World Oil & Gas, we let no grass grow underneath our feet. We're focused on one thing, finding and producing oil and gas reserves. And I think we've demonstrated that. If you look today at our performance and what we've done for shareholder value, we're up nearly twice listing. Um, we've delivered on everything we said we would. We make it a point to communicate effectively with our shareholders. In other words, we don't bring them inside, but when they, when they contact us, we give them information in connection with what's already available out in the public domain. A lot of people come to us just for clarification purposes, really. They respect us in that regard. But uh, what's important for us to, to really demonstrate to our shareholder base is that they can, de they can connect the dots. When we say we're going to do something, we do it, and we do it on time. And let me tell you, that's not always easy. It takes a lot of pre-planning, thought. Sometimes it's like herding cats, but, but we managed to get it done. Well, before we go into an investment criteria, we really need to talk about a strategy because the criteria supports the strategy. Our strategy was to look at anything that made sense globally, where it was in late stage exploration, where we could again offer the investor um, a high multiple return uh, with a reasonable entry fee, in a process where we could systematically reduce risk along the way. Now how does that tie into our criteria? Well the criteria is simple. Late stage exploration, operatorship, as much working interest as we can have, close to a world oil price, all the drivers which, when you connect the dots, maximize value. Another important part of our criteria was to be in very close proximity to basins which generate prolific amounts of oil and gas reserves. In the case of Belize, we're in the Patine Basin. The Patine Basin is located in southern Mexico and eastern Guatemala, and it's generated billions of barrels of proven developed producing reserves. When you're in that close of proximity to that kind of source rock, it's then the application of the, 
of the right technology that gets you there, that gets you to a discovery, that gets you to the results you're looking for. You're just taking one more element out of the equation. Is there oil here? And do we have a prolific enough source rack to support significant reserves in our block? Well, clearly our goal is to make an oil and gas discovery. We're not focused on placing equity to, to thrive. We're not focused on just doing things for the sake of it, just busy work. We're focused on applying our experience, the appropriate application of technology available to us to find and produce oil and gas. That's what we're all about. That's what we're good at. Our team is incredibly talented. Everywhere from field operations to, to uh, commercial operations to transaction work to geophysical, geologic, drilling operations. Uh, I have to tell you, in 32 years, I've not worked with a better team. I'm very proud of them, and I'm honored to be their, their chief executive. Where I hope we end up in the first year, right now we're, we're very close to twice listing, I'm hoping we'll be at a much greater figure than that by May 11th, which is our anniversary date. In two years from now, we should have delivered that multiple that we're seeking. Well, our plan is to complete phase three seismic, earn into the next 12.5% working interest. Uh, from that point forward, we'll establish a base camp operation near our first two locations. We've already identified our first two locations uh, in the CPR, which has been just released, which is an exciting document. What we've done in this CPR, what our CP's done that we've agreed with, and I, I want to stress that there is no difference in the opinion between our competent person and ourselves, we're on the same page, is we've identified six structures on the Blue Creek license block and, uh, and four zones, or vert vertically rather, into the subsurface. These are upper Cretaceous zones, they're carbonates, they're dolomites, um, and they're very, very thick reservoirs. We've uh, developed a very strong level of confidence as to the hydrocarbon system, which is the existence of the traps in the subsurface. Well, I'll digress a bit. The hydrocarbon system is defined as source, migration, maturation, trap, and seal. So when you have a source rock which generates oil, it's going to migrate. And it's going to migrate, hopefully, through a thermal environment where it won't maturate or overly maturate or uh, overheat and become thick or biodegrade with access to other elements in the subsurface which can affect its properties. And eventually, it'll find, it'll hopefully find a trap which has a seal mechanism. So source, migration, trap, and seal. We've answered a lot of those questions through our analysis from phase one and phase two. Again, we take a multi-phased approach designed at reducing risk every step of the way until where the next logical step is to pick up the drill bit and have a look. So what does that mean? Well, in our efforts technically, looking in 2D, even if you have compelling evidence in the subsurface and offset neighboring fields like we do, you're never gonna ever get your risk in terms of uh, success rate, really much better than about a one in four, one in 4.5. That's about as good as it gets in 2D. When you're looking in 3D, uh, about a 30%. I've never really seen it more than 32% probability of geologic success. So that still means you have a you know, 68% failure rate. So what we've done is we've gone from a, a range of one in eight to one in 12, up 62% to a one in five, just by completing phase two seismic. Phase three will hopefully high grade this even more. We expect to complete phase three, I'm thinking sometime by the end of February, where we'll have another update to our competent persons report out sometime by late February to early March. Following that, I don't see much changing in our subsurface structures. Uh, we'll go ahead and mobilize in a base camp, which will be probably a 50, 60 man base camp. And then we'll also be tendering out and mobilizing in a drilling rig. The drilling rig will be designed to drill to the upper Jurassic. That's to pierce the entire Cretaceous interval. 
Um, and that's on Blue Creek, located at about 11,300, 11,600 feet, depending on these two locations. Once we complete our two obligation wells, we've earned into 100% working interest, as Peter said, and the far more Blue Creek exploration reverts to a 5% override. So our forward operations over the next six months are to complete phase three seismic, move in a base camp, mobilize in a drilling rig. The following six months to drill the first well and hopefully have results by the end of 12. The uh, following six months after that, we'll move the drilling rig to a second location and, um, and drill the second obligation well, likely have it done by the end of the first half of 2013. We've identified six structures on Blue Creek in the Upper Cretaceous. These structures look identical in terms of their trap and aerial closure to that of the producing field Spanish Lookout to the south. Remember now, phase one and phase two seismic enabled us to correlate the Cretaceous intervals which are producing from Spanish Lookout and their neighboring producing field, the Never Delay field, directly under these structures. So we have no doubt we're producing, or w could be producing, from the same interval. The CPR says that. Um, furthermore, what we did was we agreed with our CP to calculate volumetrics on the first two structures we plan to drill. Why? Well, certainly we can count volumetrics, or calculate volumetrics for all structures, and we have. In, in many categories, the P10, P50, P90, and mean categories. But what we haven't done is we haven't run economics on those. What we want to demonstrate to our shareholders and to the market, we're realistic, we're conservative, we understand what we're doing. Our plans are to report volumes which we intend to drill up, discover, and produce, and then go on to the other structures, taking what we've learned from the first two. Usually in oil and gas operations, what, happen, what happens is, is that uh, when you have a subsurface interpretation and you drill on it, you obtain more information. Remember, as good as it gets in 2D is, what, 20, 22 percent probability of geologic success. You have a high probability of failure. So that means things change. So you take what's changed, you apply it to your other structures, and that changes their geometry, their shape, and ultimate volumetrics. So there's no sense in us going out there and painting a rosy picture of all this blue sky when the sky is going to change. What's important to us is to be realistic, honest, straightforward, and accurate. You know, we don't want to come across as promoters. As I said before, we're all career oil and gas people, and we're focused on making an oil and gas discovery. I would like to give our shareholders the clear message that we are accessible. We understand their concerns and their needs. We'll never bring them inside, but we'll certainly be able to respond to their questions relative to what's out in the public domain. Sometimes people just simply don't understand. And when shareholders buy into a company, A, they want to know the management, they want to understand this degree of honesty, competence, and what their plans are. And most importantly, when they get into the minutia and the detail, they want to have a, a layman's understanding of what they're dealing with. And I think that's important. And when I look at all the other companies that we compete against, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, not denigrating those companies. I mean, they make us stronger. You know, I, I honor them for that. Because a lot of people don't give the shareholder the access they deserve. Now, there are times when I'm traveling and I'm moving about and people send me two-foot-long emails that I just can't simply respond to. And for that, I apologize. But we'll make every attempt to answer every email, every phone call, just so that people remain informed and stay in our stock.